Hello, I'm Robert McMullen, MD. I'm a psychiatrist in New York City, and I've been doing psychopharmacology for over 35 years, and I got fairly good at it. I went to Georgetown Medical School, and I did my residency in, uh, in psychiatry at Columbia, which was a great place. In the last nine years, I've added TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to my armamentarium, and I'm extremely pleased that I did. I obtained it because so many people with medicine don't come all the way up to normal, even when you spend years trying. And with treatment-resistant people, people who failed three or four adequate trials of medication, 30% of them come all the way to normal, and uh, another 30% or at least 50% better. And many of those people would become euthymic all the way better if they could just have 60 or more treatments, because when they finish the six-week trial, often the people who don't reach normal are still on a downward path. So if you keep going, they probably get better. I've had many people who didn't get better till 50 or more treatments. Now what I want to talk about is um, new research about TMS in 2019. There were just two big conferences on TMS in Vancouver, Canada. One was the Clinical Society of TMS, which is the United States uh, Society. And it's been around about 10 years. And that went for two days. Then there was a day off, and then they had three days of the International Brain Stimulation Conference. And this happens every two years. And this includes all types of brain stimulation, including uh, neurosurgeons who impl do electrical implants in the brain and people who do transcranial direct st stimulation, which means passing electricity in a very small amount across the brain. Uh, it's really quite interesting. There's a lot of basic science, and very much of the lectures deal with TMS. There's some things that are very interesting. Uh, usually, we've always done, since uh, Alvaro Pasquale did the first study some 25 years ago that showed that TMS worked for depression, the treatment has been left excitatory treatment on the dorsal left uh, pre, pre, prefrontal cortex, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And, uh, and then uh, it was gradually observed that if you did an inhibitory treatment on the right, it worked just as well. And then many of us started doing it bilaterally and it seemed to work better. However, it looks like by studies that if you do left excitatory, in some people, or right inhibitory, or bilateral, they're all equal. So uh, there's no big reason to do bilateral or, or uh, to choose one or the other. The bilateral is a little better in some people, apparently. Now, another thing that's happened in the last few years is we've started to use more and more theta burst. And uh, it's called TBS, theta burst stimulation. If you do an inhibitory treatment, which you could do here on the right, or you do an excitatory treatment, it lasts a very short amount of time. 40 seconds on the right instead of 20 or 30. And three minutes and eight seconds, I believe, on the left instead of about 30 minutes. So uh, these are really excellent things to do. Sometimes the patients feel a little short change because it's such a brief treatment. Uh, 
Another thing that's happened is that it looks like if you do two treatments per day, you are really increasing the odds that the person will respond. In one study, the people who received two treatments per day for 15 days did just as well as people who had one treatment per day for 30 days. So that means half as much travel to the, the clinic to get your treatment. If you also use Theta Burst, then you could uh, do the treatments very briefly and that way fit them in with having a number of patients. It's ideal if you have the treatments 30 minutes or 60 minutes or even 90 minutes apart, but 15 minutes will have a benefit. So you could do one person have a treatment and then another one in 15 minutes and they may only spend 20 minutes in the uh, chair. But you could also do somebody an hour or so apart and then have other people being treated in between. It adds a lot more paperwork and more work for staff, but it would be well worth it if you could speed up the process of people getting better. Now, another, a couple of other things have happened. One is that if you treat on the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, which is here, it's right in the middle, and, uh, and uh, where the two halves of the brain uh, meet each other, if you <coughs> treat here, it has a significant antidepressant effect. And <coughs> Jonathan Downer, the great researcher in Toronto, predicted this in a complicated paper he wrote, I think it must be eight years ago or so now, <coughs> and subsequently he proved that this worked. This seems to work a little better in people that have impulse control problems, that they uh, are too quick to allow other people to inveigle them into using substances, or they're too quick to get angry at uh, an in-law or a teacher, and um, or saying, uh, I'm so angry at that boss, I'm going to go and tell her just what she's like, which doesn't have a good effect on your job prospects. Those people treated with the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, it seems like they have more benefit than average and this impulsiveness decreases. And this has worked out rather well in many people with borderline personality. Uh, borderline personality uh, people are ones who have many mood swings during the day and uh, often very quickly that somebody says something that hurts their feelings or they can just be up and down quite a few times per day and they notice it and their friends and families notice it. As they get older they get a lot better and uh, and when they are significantly older, many of them never, no longer have the diagnosis. But it'd be nice to improve that uh, soon. And it's a little bit of bipolarity to it since there's these big swings. Another place that has been found to treat depression is the right orbital frontal cortex, which means the part of the brain, the cortex, that's uh, where the orbit is, right above the eye. Jonathan Downer's paper gave a few reasons why this would probably be a place to treat, theoretically. The only reason I remember was fairly memorable. Someone, a man or a woman, I can't remember, was chronically severely depressed for years, and they just couldn't stand it. So they finally got a pistol and put it in their mouth and, and pulled the trigger. 
Now, he or she didn't die, and not only that, they stopped being depressed. And they were uh, in a normal mood, not depressed for the rest of their life. So uh, the doctors looked at the x-rays and everything, and what had happened was the right orbital frontal cortex was blown away. So that would seem to be the ultimate inhibition of that area, is to just cut it out. So that was one of the pieces of information, only one, that, um, that caused him to conclude that this was a place to treat. Well, sure enough, it's worked out. Now, it also seems to work out for a, a certain type of personality, somebody who is conservative and controlled. I don't understand all of this. I'm beginning to read about it and try to understand more of the details. But when you have ideas up here of doing something impulsive and a little wild, like go skydiving or rock climbing or drug using or uh, arguing with people you shouldn't argue with, then there has to be an opposing force in the brain. There always is. And this opposing force comes up in this right orbital frontal cortex, and it evaluates and says, well, maybe you shouldn't do this. Maybe we have to look at the facts and you should restrain yourself. So this has a restraining uh, effect on overly emotional responses. Now, when this uh, area becomes hyperact uh, hyperactive, then it's, it's like a negative evaluation that it's doing here. So this negative tendency becomes depression. And so that's the reason that particular person is depressed. So the person who is quite depressed, but they're a controlled person. They're maybe a little bit obsessive compulsive. They're not emoting emotions all over the place, like some people that are depressed might. They're very controlled and uh, sober-minded. And, uh, and that person is a little higher to have this cause a response. Um, in fact, I have a patient recently, and I think I had done 60 or more treatments on him in the past because he's so chronically, severely depressed and not functioning. And uh, it didn't really help him. Maybe there was a 10 or 20% improvement, but it could have been just by accident. So uh, recently, a couple years later, I started doing this. And I'm also doing it twice a day. And he is really responding. He's feeling better, he's smiling more, and I think it's only been, you know, 10 sessions or so, not, not a gigantic amount. Uh, there's a, one type of person who does not respond to TMS, and that's the depressed person who has no cognitive distortions. No matter what type of psychiatric disorder you have, there's generally a lot of cognitive distortion. So even somebody who's merely too anxious all the time, they're likely to see the world as a little more dangerous uh, or see that there's bad possibilities that could happen to them or to their children or something. Uh, there's always these distortions and in depression, the distortions are usually that um, I'm inferior to other people, uh, you know, they feel low self-esteem, they feel they're not good enough looking, uh, they're not functional enough, and nobody likes me, and all these things. And so what cognitive therapy does is they try to get the person to argue with themselves, because really it's like the prosecutor getting up and giving his case and then the defense lawyer stands up and, well, I have nothing to say. <laughs> so you're sort of convicting yourself of these things. And it's better to argue with yourself and say, 
uh, if nobody likes me, then why have I had so many friends in the past who have liked me and I've kind of avoided them? Uh, with each thing, it's an exaggeration. But if you find someone who's depressed, who doesn't have that, uh, then they often, if not usually, don't respond to the TMS. For example, I had a 22-year-old man who'd been depressed all his life and for two periods in his life, his senior year and a semester in college, his mood lifted 50%. He still felt terribly depressed, but then he could function. He joined uh, various uh, organizations. He played sports. He developed a lot of friends who he liked. He liked people. They liked him and uh, functioned extremely well. Nobody would know that he's depressed, but then he went back into it. But he had no cognitive distortions. He uh, didn't have low self-esteem. He didn't blame himself. He didn't feel excessively guilty. And he would say, you know, I have an illness. I've got this illness of depression. I feel bad I have it. I feel really bad that my parents have to support me. What can I do? You know, I'd rather not be like this. And uh, I gave him many treatments. It must have been 70 or more. And no response at all. Now, I'm not sure about this, but I think that with this right OFC inhibitory treatment that maybe a little bit more people will, with this uh, lack of cognitive distortion, will respond and get better. I've had one case so far that has. And, uh, and actually two cases, that's two, because I mentioned another one. So I've actually had two. And, uh, and one person who moved out of state and I had kept him alive with four or 500 treatments, he committed suicide maybe a year after he left. And that I feel really bad about because I think that if I had done this treatment with him, it might have finally been the treatment that would have brought him up to normal or near normal. Um, let me see. One other thing. There's many things that I learned and there's many things coming out in the research. It's amazing. But one other thing is that when you do left-sided excitatory, if you add an inhibitory treatment up here, it's called the pre-SMA, which means the pre-supplementary supplementary motor area, it definitely adds to the benefit. Uh, this area, when you do an inhibitory treatment here, helps out OCD. And when you add them together, you get a better antidepressant effect than, than uh, the left side alone. In the uh, original way of treating, you would do 30 minutes of excitatory here and 20 or 30 minutes here. You end up with 45 minutes or close to an hour in treatment. But if you use the theta burst, you can do it three minutes here 40 seconds here, so the whole treatment would last four minutes and with moving the coil and everything else, maybe five or six minutes, which makes it uh, really affordable in time and money. This is Dr. Robert McMullen. I'm a psychiatrist in New York City, and I just summarized some new information about TMS. Thank you very much, Dr.